Howdy, Tonzilla Files, and welcome to another episode of Escaping the Cave. Tonzilla Xpot, escapingthecave.com. Fuck Twitter. Hi there. February 11th, 2020. It's primary day up in the beautiful, beautiful state of New Hampshire. I love New Hampshire. A lot of you may not know, we lived in Massachusetts up till about a couple of years ago. Not very long, maybe a year. Lived in northern Massachusetts. Maybe a 10, 15 minute drive from the New Hampshire state line. No sales tax in uh, New Hampshire on things like televisions. Tobacco's cheap up there. It's beautiful. New Hampshire, one of the greatest states that I have ever seen. I loved it up there. Anyway, the primary is going on today. I don't have any information on that whatsoever. It's mid-afternoon now. I haven't had the TV on a news channel since this weekend. I watched a little bit of The Office last night. Been reading, researching, a lot of which will be vomited your way today. I really have no idea what's going on uh, with the New Hampshire primary. Um, probably will comment maybe a little bit on that uh, a little bit later on, but I've had enough politics. There's stuff that I could talk about, the firing of Vindman and uh, Sondman. I think his name's Sondman, right? The ambassador, dude. We are in a state, my friends. And honestly, I don't think that discussing the particulars and specifics of it on a regular basis really matter anymore. Once the impeachment acquittal happened, once that threshold was crossed last week, the specifics of that trial no longer matter. Everything should be focused on, in my not-so-humble opinion, on where we're headed. Not even with the election, mind you. I know this is the next most important election ever. No election shall ever be as important as no one has ever been as important. Just like 2016, just like 2012, just like 2000. Okay, fine. I get the narrative. But the process and the institutions are breaking down. Trust and faith in government and the electoral process in all of our institutions, every single one of them, there is no faith trust left in them. We have faith, a blind religious faith, in our specific doctrines. But again, it's turned into what um, Matt Taibbi called in his book, Hate, Inc., Hitler versus Hitler. Our guy is great. That is Hitler. Wash, rinse, repeat, and attribute those statements to the other side directed at you as well. That's where we are. There is no collective faith in the process. I mentioned last week. Howard Dean came out and said, if the Democrats lose this election in September and uh, November, the Democrats will challenge the results because, you know, the Republicans always cheat. So not only do we have Trump obviously going to challenge the election results if he loses, now the Democrats are going to do the same thing. We have no chance, no prayer of having what people used to call a peaceful transfer of power or a peaceful continuance of power. These are dire times. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. I was watching The Office peacefully last night. I watched Curb Your Enthusiasm as well. By the way, Curb Your Enthusiasm is a wonderful disinfectant. If you're looking for one, and really, at this point in time, who isn't? So, very little politics for you today. That's going to be about it. I may have something on Rush Limbaugh a little bit later on. Uh, Not on Limbaugh himself. On the award. Yes, that was some fun watching this week, this past week. He got the Congressional or the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Oh, that's just terrible. Oh. Really? Yeah, that's what you're obsessing on, huh? Well, a lot of people did. I did a little searching. Like I say, I go track the you know, virtual cyber wildlife so you don't have to. I may have something on that later because it actually kind of ties into what I'm going to talk about today. And we're going to get back to the independent thought thing that I was on. Uh, before the Iowa primary or Iowa caucus debacle of a week ago. Basically, what I'm talking about is taking control of your own mind, reclaiming intellectual autonomy, not being thought for, not mistaking someone else's disseminated propaganda spin agenda, however you want to phrase it, not mistaking that for your own autonomous thought. Independent thought. Critical thought. Who are you and what do you believe independent of of, of all these rhetorical enemas that you're constantly, constantly enduring? 
I've also uh, discovered a deep love, an infatuation, a man crush, if you will, and you just did, for Walter Lippmann. I mentioned Walter Lippmann a lot in the podcast last year for very specific and isolated reasons, though. I've seen his name come up in a number of books, a number of uh, things that I've read over the years. I was familiar with him. I knew who he was. I had a pretty good idea what he did, and I had kind of an inkling, although it was confused, a confused inkling of what he stood for. I liked this, and I didn't like that, and then I liked this, and I didn't like that. Well, I come to find out. I've, I've, I've delved, d- divin, divin deeply, divin, <laughs> dived deeply. <laughs> Into the orifice that is Walter Lippmann. And I've learned a lot about the man. I've read a lot of his material in the last couple of weeks. I've discovered that uh, he was, as I said last year, he was a socialist early on. A young socialist, if you'll excuse the cliche. Up until about uh, the end of World War I, and he saw the effects of uh, propaganda. And suppressed political speech, political writing. Suppressed by the U.S. government during World War I. And in the lead up to World War I to sway public opinion into supporting a war that this population wanted nothing to do with. He saw the effects of propaganda that affected him in a lot of ways, but he also had a transition away from socialism, a rather harsh transition away uh, from socialism right around 1919 or 1920, 100 years ago, literally 100 years ago. So his early writing, if you find some stuff maybe written in 1913, I forget the name of the book, but he's got a book that he put out right around then when he was young. He was an idealistic socialist. If you read that, you're not going to get a clear conception of who Howard Lippmann was. And I found this book called the, um, what was it called? The Phantom Public. Sort of a collector's item now. It was released shortly after um, Public Opinion which I think was put out in 1920, talking about propaganda and how people really can't make, they're not, they're not to be trusted. Like the, the collective or the, the accepted wisdom of the all-wise mob, of the people, the people know what's best for them. He basically proceeded to start to obliterate that, as I heard it called, bromide with public opinion. Well, the phantom public went further down that line and actually postulated that the public, we the people, we don't exist. That it's a transient sort of um, manifestation based on public opinion around a certain topic. Like people will get interested in a certain topic, and then, yes, of course, there's at least the illusion of the public. But then it, it, it becomes diffuse when the topic changes, and other people sort of move in who are interested in this subject or this topic and want to comment on it. But really, there is, in his view... No, we the people, in a consistent, solid state, if that makes sense. I have not completed the book yet, a good portion of it, but it's a collector's item now because he wrote this and he was, he was basically, <laughs> he was an apostate. Democracy is doomed to fail, especially if you're relying upon the unwashed, filthy mobs to be informed and to understand the issues, they just can't do it. He wasn't being, he wasn't condemning the public so much as he was saying the public is not qualified because they do not have enough time to understand the issues. They're working, they have families, they pay very, very cursory, very shallow attention to the issues of the day. But as uh, Bernays and other people have pointed out, including Lippmann, they're all eager. Oh, boy, they're all eager to, to give their opinion on it, let you know what they really think when they don't really know anything. It's an excellent book. I think this is the third time I've said it's become so, somewhat of a collector's item. And the reason that is is because that train of thought and that angle that he was taking in 1920-ish, 23 maybe, 25, whatever, was heresy. Heresy against the institution of democracy. To say democracy was flawed and that the people didn't know what was really best for the entire country was heretical. It was iconoclastic. He was an apostate. Pick your adjective. Or your noun. He was afraid that being the heretic that he was, the heretics, they sometimes get lynched. And he thought he was going to be thrown out of uh, literary circles. He wasn't going to be able to write 
was going to be able to make a living. That He was just going to be attacked. He was going to be canceled by the institution of the time. Institutions of the time. So that book, while uncomfortable to read and uncomfortable to publish, considering the content from what I've read anyway, I wasn't there, but what I've read, it was pretty well received. And it's turned out over time, over the ensuing hundred years or so, to be considered one of his best books right behind public opinion. And maybe uh, Preface to Morals, I think. And I see why. And this book is only maybe 200 pages, 200 very small 1920s-ish pages. The cheapest I can find it in new condition. It's back in print now, back in limited print. A few people have it. Like 38 bucks is the cheapest I can find for this little, I don't know, 180, 200 page, uh, 100 year old piece of writing. But he's got so much crammed into that little book that fits It applies to what it is that I'm trying to get across, that people do not understand their own world. They can't possibly do it. Again, this is not accusatory. It's begging humility to understand and have people realize and admit to themselves, despite all of the you know, congratulatory back padding that people want to throw your way to get you to listen to their stuff and vote for them. Despite all of that, The demand for just basic human collective humility to understand that these issues and this world is too complicated for you in your daily life, going to work, raising your kids, doing everything else that life requires and demands of you, you cannot possibly understand what's happening and how it all fits together. Even if you had all the time in the world, How would you do it? You can't go see it. You can't go sit in in these congressional hearings, can you? You're dependent, therefore, upon your spin of choice. You are sitting ducks. We, we, I have to use we here. We are sitting ducks. We are completely dependent upon what we are fed and what we choose to eat. If somebody wants to put some arsenic in that intellectual fare... We're consuming arsenic and not knowing any different. And therein lies the problem. And he wrote this book. He wrote this stuff. He and Bernays put this material out a hundred years ago when television was still a bit of a pipe dream. How, how, I ask you again, how have things changed In a hundred years, with the advent of not only television, not only broadcast television and radio, by the way. This is the early days of radio, he put this. He's talking in the terms of print newspapers and magazines, for crying out loud. The advent of radio. And then television. And then not only that, then we had cable TV, what, in the 1970s. And then the cable news came along 35, 40 years ago. How have things deteriorated in that respect as we have thrust our way, unwrapped, into the Internet age? Where we are so awash in disconnected information and data that we cannot possibly, if they couldn't keep it all straight in 1920, how, pray tell, do we expect to do it today. How can we even pretend that we have the capacity to do that? We can't. On some level, Tonzilla Files, I think you understand this. I think instinctively most of us, not even not even you highly evolved intellectual Tonzilla File, I think beyond that, I think most people understand this innately. There's a uh, issue of your undivided or issue, uh, an episode rather of your undivided attention that came out. I just finally got caught up on that podcast, but it talks about trust falls. Who do you trust when you are being bombarded with conflicting information constantly? Conflicting and overwhelming amounts of information. How do you possibly sort through it all? It is literally impossible, even if you had 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and were a busy little beaver doing your diligent civic duty, 
you couldn't do it. You cannot research all of that, and even the research you're doing on that material is still secondhand. You can't go investigate this in person to make your, to draw your own conclusions. And add on top of that, the monetization motivation. People commercializing this stuff because they know you don't know what to believe. They know you backed yourself basically into a tribal corner where you've adopted this or that because you can't make sense of it, heads or tails of anything. They know you've backed yourself into that trailer park. So now they just craft the material targeted at that specific trailer park, or this trailer park over here, because they know they have a captively confused audience who's given up who has stopped trying to sort through everything to think for themselves, and now they can just pipe this feces, this refuse, this sewage into their homes and sell Ovaltine at the same time. Metaphorically speaking, see, I'm sick and tired of saying dick pills. I shouldn't say, eh, they're selling dick. I say that all the time. I really want to say it again. (laughs) Let's say Ovaltine, since I'm spending a lot of time in the 50s and 20s these days on the podcast. Ovaltine. Mmm. You with me? The first step to this, as I kind of twist this uh, steam liner back to independent thought, the, the trick to this is understanding your limitations and understanding that you cannot possibly get a grasp on all of this. And then you have to take the next step, in my opinion, you have to take the next step and understand that your media, your influencers understand this as well. And therefore... Therefore, since you haven't admitted it yet, they understand that they can pretty much give you anything you want. 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 is the key word here. Because of your trailer park affiliation, and they can sell those eyeballs to advertisers with impunity. Who's going to challenge them? Truth has fallen apart, man. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. That episode called Trust Falls, Your Undivided Attention, it's creepy. It it listens like a Black Mirror episode. Talking about deep fakes and what they can do with it. They're talking about text-based deep fakes where they can figure out your trigger words. what, What sort of language will appeal to you based on what you click on. And they can craft advertisements using AI. In that language, they could try to sell you a Trojan condom in the in the voice and the language of Shakespeare. They're learning how to do this stuff. It's not just the video deepfakes. Audio deepfakes are coming as well. Terrifies the shit out of me. What could, what could somebody do with this? We don't know who to trust. We do not know what to trust. And it goes beyond just politics, media. There is no foundation of belief, anywhere to stand on solid belief ground anymore because everything is up in the air. And I think in my head, and in my opinion, obviously, the trick, gently sort of tapping that nail, trying to to get that into the skull, is to disconnect. The answer is not more information, more current events data. It's less. The one criticism that I have of your undivided attention, and it's not a very big one, considering where they come from. These are former tech people, worked inside of the tech industry, and were horrified by where it was going. Considering where they come from, my one criticism is that they always look to tech to save us. Like, maybe tech will be the answer. Maybe we'll figure out how to use technology to rescue us from all this. Yay! The, the answer, is the, the, the consideration is never, hey, just turn this shit off. Cut the data streams. Uh-huh. Starting with social media, Facebook and Twitter. Or at least get the political crap, the disinformation stuff away from you. The people who are pelting you constantly with partisan bullshit. Cut those voices out of the data stream. Just get rid of them. You don't need them. They're not helping anything. It's an intentional campaign to keep you agitated. 
I can tell you this. What they do not want is a disconnected, considerate, thinking citizen. Advertisers hate that too. If they can't reach you, they can't control you. And I mean that two-pronged. If they can't reach you with the data stream, if you are cut off from the data stream, the advertising stream, the propaganda stream, if you are physically cut off from that, they can't reach you. They can't jack with your head. Also, if you are psychologically disconnected, taking a, a, a hard-line cynical attitude toward everything, if you're that detached man I like to talk about, they can't reach you either. You've got a cognitive firewall put up. They hate that. They cannot have you in a thoughtful state. That is the foundational intent of agitation propaganda, to keep poking and poking and poke, 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 to get you riled up into some lathered state of emotional uh, frenzy. Because then you're susceptible. Susceptible to suggestion. I have a lot of material I could talk about from Edward Bernays about that. That if you can get somebody lathered up, they are receptive to suggestion. What is social media, particularly Twitter, what is social media, political social media, political Twitter, political Facebook, what is it if not that? Constant streams of agitation being uh, not only put forth by the, the media outlets, uh, but your friends, in quotes, sharing stuff. Throwing it at you, saying, here, look at these assholes, look at these assholes, hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them. What is the cumulative effect of all of that? We've talked about it. We've talked about agitation propaganda on this podcast last year. I have a whole a pretty good series on it, I think, right around August. It's terrifying. The goal of agitation propaganda is to create and or incite hatred. Hatred. Primal. I'm not talking about, oh, I hate her. I'm talking about, I fucking hate and want to kill him. I want him destroyed. He is Hitler. And there are no rules in a battle against Hitler. Correct? That's the goal of agitation propaganda. And I'm sorry, my friends. I'm sorry to tell you this. Sorry to be the one to drop this truth bomb on you. But our biggest agitators aren't coming from the Ukraine or Russia. They're coming from right here in our friends lists. Maybe they're finding it from Ukraine or Russia or wherever. Maybe the DNC, the RNC, doesn't matter. The ones spreading this shit are you and I. Without you and I, it uh, goes nowhere. We are our own worst enemy when it comes to propaganda and disinformation because the proselytes become amateur propagandists themselves. They take the message, not only the, the shared links and all that stuff, they take the core of the message, re, maybe rewrite it, reword it, rearticulate it, and then fart it out, shit it out into the matrix as their own to be lapped up by other proselytes, militants, to be taken away like the coronavirus and... <coughs> all over cyberspace. We are the propagandists as well. And if you don't understand that, if you don't accept that, if you don't internalize it and take responsibility for that, take accountability for that, I got nothing for you, man. I got no use for you. And you got no use for me. This is a waste of Why are you here? Are you lost? <sighs> Sean Hannity's down the hall. Perhaps you'd like a little meadow. Rachel Meadow. She's uh, down the, the, the back way there toward the bathroom. We are in a dire place, my friends. We are. I said last year. Uh, was it last year? No, I think maybe it was uh, since I've returned that basically the, 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 the script here for the rest of this year, has been pretty much laid out. That there were two things, two episodes we were waiting to see in this electoral drama. One was uh, Acquittal Day, which happened last week. And, of course, Trump's uh, victory tour. <laughs> and uh, 
purge, I guess, on Friday. And the next one is figure out who the hell or what the hell is going to come out of the Democratic primary. But, but that's it. The rest of it is, is, is pretty much laid. It, it's set in stone. We know how this is going to go. And even the election doesn't matter. It doesn't. In the long run, I know you've bought into this. It's the most important election in the history of mankind, probably the universe. I know you bought into that. It doesn't matter. Trump's elected. The woke flake crowd is going to radicalize. If the woke flakes win, Trump's people are not going to stand down. Do you think, I've asked this question a number of times, do you think that they cannot further radicalize in response to your win? They can, and yes, they will. It doesn't matter in the long run. If we can project ourselves forward 10, 15, 20 years, this election, you could run it through a simulator, it wouldn't matter. It's the people, my friends. It is us. It is the data streams. It is the abandonment of objective truth, understandably. I have to, I found the path to empathy here. I was struggling to grab onto this last year. You can thank Walter Lippmann for that. To a point. (laughs) He doesn't think much of you. (laughs) If you're a populist, if you have a a hard-on for the elites, and don't go reading Walter Lippmann. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I say don't go read him. You probably should. Just for the alternative viewpoint he's going to offer you. Because what he says, I hate it. I hate what Edward Bernays says in his books, talking about propaganda and how people are so easily led and so malleable. And how the voice of the people is essentially babble. Because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I hate it. I despise it. It sounds to me like heresy, being a red-blooded American. A proud American, too. But God damn it, they make a whole hell of a lot of sense. If you look at the, the situation that we're in right now, when data and information has been unleashed upon us, it does not reflect well on the human race, the human species, and our ability to see reality and ourselves as it really is. Also, it does not reflect well on where we are going. We're devolving into a barbaric primal state, a tribal state, where anyone who is not one of us is the enemy. To be killed and devoured, vanquished. This is what happens when the mob rules. When people who know better have their hands yanked from the wheel. There is something to be said for the elites. There is something to be said for people who know what the hell's going on setting policy. Instead of Iowa or New Hampshire or a gaggle of rednecks in Kansas, or a bunch of hippies out at Berkeley. One is not better than the other. They're just dining on the feces of different species. That's it. Well, this is screwed. I'm a half hour into this. I'm coming up on a half hour into this damn thing, and I haven't even started. Self, what should I do? Well, Todd... You could continue and make this a two, two and a half hour podcast, or you could just shut it down here. Huh. Great. You are listening to the Escaping the Cave podcast, escapingthecave.com. That's my website. And make sure, please, kindly, kindly make sure that you are subscribed to the Escaping the Cave podcast rather than the Christopher Media feeds. By all means, check out ChristopherMedia.net. But if you are subscribed to my podcast, okay, if you're listening uh, for this, this particular podcast, make sure you are subscribed to the Escaping the Cave podcast feed on your favorite podcatchers. Please kindly and thank you. 
I appreciate it. This is a weird episode today. I had stacks of material I was going to delve into today that was talking about independent thought and um, validation addiction. I'm still going to get to that at some point, but not today. This is sort of taking on a life of its own. So what I wanted to do was take some of the material that I have collected from Walter Lippmann, and I wanted to give you a, a little bit deeper of an insight into some of his writing. The man's fantastic. He really is. He's, he's quickly climbing <laughs> into the top three, probably, of uh, my favorite writers, along with um, Orwell and maybe Christopher Hitchens, and eh, maybe top five. Anyway, I found an article that he had put out in 1919. This was published in The Atlantic in November of 1919. 101 years ago, and this article was 7,000 words long. <laughs> Don't worry. You're not getting all 7,000 words, I promise you. Uh, but it, it was fantastic. And I was just, I was blown away from it, by it. It was one of those uh, articles that I, when I found it and started sort of sifting through it, I wound up just uh, taking it out. I cut and pasted it into my Word thing and uh, printed the entire article up so I could go back to it without having to, to read the thing online. And uh, this really gives you an idea of what he thought about things like data overload and the all-knowing wisdom of the mob and the crowd and we, uh, the people. I found him and really got interested in him last year when I found a quote by Mr. Lippmann that said, uh, the uh, people who can't discern truth from falsehood do not remain free or something like that. This piece elaborates on that uh, general idea. And it goes something like this. Uh, Because we have no current information and no background of facts, we are, of course, the undiscriminating objects of any agitator who choose to rant against foreigners. Now, he's saying foreigners in this context. He's talking about immigrants. This is 1919, okay? Uh, But you can apply, you could substitute the word foreigners for just about anything in this day and age. Undiscriminating objects of any agitator who choose to rant against X, right? He continues on by saying that uh, now men who have lost their grip upon the relevant facts of their environment are the inevitable victims of agitation and propaganda. The quack, the charlatan, the jingo, and the terrorist can flourish only where the audience is deprived of independent access to information. Again, I'm going to stop down here. It doesn't matter why they're deprived. I've mentioned this and said this a number of times. It doesn't matter if they're deprived by choice, by the market forces of news and information. It doesn't matter. If they cannot get independent access to information, the quack, the charlatan, the jingo, the terrorist, whatever, the propagandist can flourish in those situations and typically do. He continues on to say that, uh, but where all news comes at second hand, where all the testimony is uncertain, (laughs) men cease to respond to truths and respond simply to opinions. Hmm. The environment in which they act is not the realities themselves, uh, but the pseudo-environment of reports, rumors, and guesses. The whole reference of thought comes to be what somebody asserts, not what actually is. Since they're deprived of any trustworthy means of knowing what is really going on, since everything is on the plane of assertion and propaganda, they believe whatever fits most comfortably with their prepossessions, their presuppositions, their worldview. They believe whatever fits most comfortably with what they want things to be. He continues on to say that this breakdown of the means of public knowledge should occur at a time of immense change is a compounding of the difficulty. If you don't think times are changing right now, pay attention here. From bewilderment to panic is a short step, he says, as everyone knows who has watched a crowd when danger threatens. At the present time, a nation easily acts like a crowd. Under the influence of headlines and panicky print, the contagion of unreason can easily spread through a settled community. For when the comparatively recent and unstable nervous organization, which makes us capable of responding to reality as it is, and not as we should wish it, is baffled over a continuing period of time, the more primitive but much stronger instincts are let loose. De-evolution. This is the scraping away of the thin veneer of civilization that I've been talking about. We are in the midst of that right now. We are. 
early stages, but still in the midst of it. I'm going to repeat that from when the comparatively recent and unstable nervous organization, which makes us capable of responding to reality as it is and not as we should wish it, when that's baffled over a continuing period of time, the more primitive but much stronger instincts are let loose. I could stop down right here and I could give you probably a 30-minute rant on blank slateism. How blank slateism wants to believe that those primitive but much stronger instincts don't exist. They're all socially engineered. Bullshit. Bullshit. Denying that Denying human instinct, denying human nature, a very primitive base human nature, denying that it still exists somewhere beneath the surface is dangerous. Because if you deny it, you ignore it. If you suppress it, turn your head like a little child at night. If I put my head under the covers, the boogeyman isn't there. If you deny that, you let it roam free. It's going to find its way through the cracks in that thin veneer. Be looking for that episode on blank slateism, my friends. In quotes. Oh, we're friends now, right? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to continue on. War and revolution, Mr. Lippman says, both of them founded on censorship and propaganda, are the supreme destroyers of realistic thinking because the excess of danger and the fearful overstimulation of passion unsettle disciplined behavior. Are we in a state of war and revolution right now? Hmm. I think we could be, at least on the, the, you know, the outer fringes of it, headed toward the center. We're sure behaving like it, aren't we? Are you ready for the revolution, says Daenerys when she takes the stage at a Bernie Sanders rally. Donald Trump is in a war against socialism. I think the psychology has taken root to some degree. Continuing on, he says, both breed fanatics, war and revolution of all kinds. Men who, in the words of Mr. Santanyana, have redoubled their effort when they have forgotten their aim. That's important. Let me repeat it. Both breed fanatics of all kinds. Men who have redoubled their effort when they have forgotten their aim. This is probably the tenth time I have mentioned Jacques Lul talking about when the means strangle the ends And this actually predates what Mr. Alul talked about. He attributed that, the elimination of the ends in favor of the means, he attributed that to Adolf Hitler. This was written in 1919, before Hitler even bothered to take office. He is talking about the means strangling the ends in 1919. Redouble their efforts when they have forgotten their aim. The effort itself has become the aim. The means have become the ends. Be listening for that episode as well. Be looking for that. He says that men live in their effort and for a time find great exaltation. They love it. They love their activism, their militantism, their proselytizing. They love it. They find exaltation. They seek stimulation and continues of their effort rather than a direction of it. Stimulation of the effort rather than direction of it. That is why both in War and Revolution there seems to operate a kind of Gresham's Law of Emotions in which leadership passes by a swift degradation from a Mirabeau to a Robespierre and in war from a high-minded statesmanship to the depths of virulent, hating jingoism. I love this article. He continues to say that the cardinal fact always is the loss of contact with objective information. Public as well as private reason depends on it. Not what somebody says, not what somebody wishes were true, but what is so beyond all our opining. That constitutes the touchstone of our sanity. The touchstone of our sanity. And a society which lives at second hand will commit incredible follies and countenance inconceivable brutalities if that contact is intermittent and untrustworthy. That contact with reality. He says they will commit incredible follies and countenance inconceivable brutalities. Is there even intermittent contact with objective reality anymore in the 21st century? I ask you. 
and show your work if you answer in the positive, in the affirmative. Where is this contact with objective reality that is not intermittent, that is trustworthy? Where is it? Tonzillax at gmail.com. Please send me a link. Please don't send me a link of my own podcast. Well, you can. I'd be flattered if you did. We're almost done here. He says that demagoguery is a parasite that flourishes where discrimination fails. And only those who are at grips with things themselves are impervious to it. Huh. Sound familiar? Let me repeat. Demagoguery is a parasite that flourishes where discrimination fails. And only those who are at grips with things themselves, reality, are impervious to it. For in the last analysis, the demagogue, whether of the right or of the left, is consciously or unconsciously an undetected liar. Demagogue warning hippies. The right has theirs. Have you detected yours yet? So anyway, that was from the uh, Walter Lippmann article that I found in the Atlantic from November of 1919. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I don't have the entire article sitting in front of me. I think I left it out in the living room. But uh, maybe, just maybe, if you're lucky, I will uh, post it to my website, escapingthecave.com. Otherwise, just go online, Walter Lippmann, two Ps, two Ns, The Atlantic, November 1919 article. I'll bet you you can find all 7,000 glorious... Glorious words of that, I don't know, masterpiece. It's incredible. It's worth the time to read it. And I'm not done. I'm going to give you one more from the Phantom Public. Now, this comes from the introduction. What I did was I, I didn't buy the book. I, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this. I found the book in PDF form on the, on the interwebs. And it was like a scan of all these pages, right? And so I basically just highlighted, cut and pasted it into my Word thing. And now I have to go through and I have to correct all the screw-ups because it was, a, I don't know how it got the text. <laughs> be perfectly honest with you. It was a, a literal picture of this book. My computer would pick up the uh, words out of the text. It's bizarre. I don't know how I did it, but, but some of the scans weren't exactly straight, so it would screw up. And there are a lot of uh, typos in there. So basically how I'm reading this book is as I go through and edit this uh, PDF file. And it's fantastic. It really is. The, even the introduction is great. I forget the guy's name. He doesn't matter. This is about Walter Lippmann. And uh, what he's talking about here is uh, the private man in this excerpt. Now, in his explanation of the current events man, Jacques Lule uh, literally talked about the private man. I don't know if he used that terminology, but he talked about the guy who was withdrawn from public wars of opinion, right? And as referred to here, this person is a rare, almost mythological creature who stepped beyond propaganda's reach. Hard to find these people. And obviously, Alul and Lippmann lived in far simpler times, but what's described in this uh, excerpt I'm going to give you is basically what advertisers, quote-unquote news outlets, political machines, PR propagandists, and their activist mules, it's what they fear most. The chronic and acerbic skeptic. Somebody who does not believe what he's told just simply because he's hearing it. He can think things through. He can take agenda into account and knows when to just basically wall somebody up and say, no. You're full of shit. Go away. I don't want to hear anything from you. Talk to the door. Right? Now, by necessity, these mind merchants, as I call them, they have to work their hardest to constantly agitate the herd, thereby preventing people from becoming thinking individuals. Individuals who are emotionally detached, immovable without just cause, and immune to anything these ubiquitous agenda-fed proselytes say. That's the person, the advertiser, and the politician, the political party apparatchik propagandist hates those people. And with good reason. And the proselytes are always going to call these guys, these people, they're always going to call them something like criminally apathetic or corrosively cynical. I've heard that a million times. You're so cynical, Todd. Why are you so cynical? You shouldn't be cynical. Fuck you. 
Yes, I should. In this day and age, <laughs> cynicism is admirable. From the perspective of the frustrated fanatical missionary whose sole essence and identity, you know, is shackled to their activism, their proselytization, their militantism as time goes on, apathetic and cynical is exactly what they are from that perspective, and maddeningly so, they can't stand it. Political slurs, nitpicky definitions aside now, this paragraph I'm going to read you at least partly describes the detachment required for dispassionate critical thought. Dispassionate critical thought. It helps illuminate, if you'll pardon the cliche, it's a bad one, sorry, helps illuminate the intellectual city on the hill. And that intellectual city on the hill is populated by unimpressed sobriety. I've already given you the warning on the phantom public. And this book, in my view, it's iconoclastic. It's, it's glorious in its, fuck you, dear reader, flamethrowing. And why do I say that? Because in an age of boutique political pandering, as what you're awash in today, one way or another, where it's safer, more profitable to blame everything on someone else rather than provoking a long look in the monkey mirror, this is a much-needed contemporary kick to democracy's face or groin. A much-needed examination of the institution and those populating it itself. Very little of that's happening. It's all finger-pointing. This does not point a finger. This entire book does not point a finger at one group or one individual. It points it directly at both you and I, all of us, collectively and our presuppositions about who and what we are, our own divinity. We need that. So yeah, be warned. If you're a humanistic, sapiens-worshipping, direct democracy, quote-unquote populist, blindly believes in the all-knowing wisdom of the pulsating, drooling mob, this book is not for you, I promise. But you should read it anyway. All right, here we go. This is from the introduction, and the second part of this is a direct quote. Uh, the uh, intro writer writes that uh, by 1925, Lippmann's doubts had deepened considerably. Uh, the opening pages of the Phantom Public even echo some of the quintessential gestures of 20s post-war intellectual disillusionment, a la Hemingway and Fitzgerald, F. Scott. He depicted the unillusioned reconsideration of the disenchanted man one of his chapters, in terms so vivid that it seems likely he was in part describing himself, I'm sure he was, and declaring his own uh, farewell to reform, his socialist ties. Here's the quote. For when the private man has lived through the romantic age in politics and is no longer moved by the stale echoes of its hot cries, when he is sober and unimpressed, his own part in public affairs appears to him a pretentious thing, a second rate and inconsequential. You cannot move him then with a good straight talk about service and civic duty, nor by waving a flag in his face, nor by sending a Boy Scout after him to make him vote. He's a man back home from a crusade to make the world something or other it did not become. And he has been tantalized too often by the foam of events, has seen the gas go out of it. He knows better. End quote. Before the he knows better. That was me. That's the skeptic. He's seen it. He's heard it all before. He knows you're full of shit. He's sick and tired of hearing the platitudes. The utopian visions build the wall. And Mexico's going to pay for it. Our universal health care. He knows better. He's sick and tired of the rhetoric. He has unplugged and he has detached. And he will come to conclusions in his own mind, in his own time, and act accordingly. That is the sober, detached man. How did I phrase it? The unimpressed, sober, and detached man. It's the only way to see the world, my friends, is to be detached. And I said, and I mentioned in another podcast, I have a paradox that I've called Todd Zilla's paradox, that the only way to see the world as it is, is emotionally and physically detached unattached to any outcome or any group. However, human beings have an insatiable need 
not even insatiable, an essential need to belong. Social validation. Checkmate. Are you waiting for the sausage party hope here? What are you looking at me like that for? If, if the only way to see the world as it is, is to detach, but yet the vast majority, almost every single human being on this planet has a need to belong to a group, a tribe, a belief system, something, to feel socially validated. How do you solve that riddle? How do you solve that equation in any meaningful way? You might have individuals who can transcend that. How do you do that en masse? That's a paradox. Good luck. And again, if you have happy thoughts, if you think I'm wrong, you want to drop some truth, send the equation with your, uh, your dispatch, please. I got so much more here. I mean, he's got this thing where he's talking about, uh, what is it? Uh, Darwin's story of the cats and clover. This is awesome. This is about, talking about how there is no external justice system. No social justice exists outside your head. And he brilliantly shows this little story from, I think, uh, Darwin. Yeah, Darwin. About how different interests, self-interests, are at the cost and the price of someone else's interests. What someone sees as justice, another person feels as injustice. He also talks in another place about getting people whose self-interest is involved in an issue, out of the discussion. Oh my God, that's going to horrify you, isn't it? Especially in this day and age of identity politics. For example, the gun debate. Whether or not guns should be you know, confiscated, the Second Amendment should be abolished, getting the families of shooting victims out of the discussion. It's horrifying to you, isn't it? No, it shouldn't be because they have a skewed opinion of things. What happened to them didn't happen to everyone else. They're not involved in a rational conversation about it. They have been emotionally compromised. This can be applied across the entire issues spectrum. Do you think Gloria Steinem should be involved in a conversation about anything to do with women's rights, abortion, anything? Anything. We know where her bias lies. He goes on to say that they should not be excluded from the public debate. I may be a little confusing here. They shouldn't be, you know, prevented from offering their insight for the simple fact that you can actually detect who they are. And if you're a discerning human being, a critical thinker, you can discount everything they say on the matter because you know their opinion is skewed. Detached. They are not detached from the conversation from the issue. I think I just sent a bunch of you into, like, epileptic seizures, didn't I? Do we have any liberals here? Raise your hand. And maybe I didn't. But how about you gun folks? Do you think that you should be involved in the public discourse, the policy-making discourse? Do you think you should be involved in that? If you've been fighting for gun rights, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You should probably be excluded from the rational conversation just as much as somebody who's had their child killed in a school. We know where your bias lies. We know you're emotionally compromised. You're too close to the issue. You are not detached from it. Good luck. I could go on and on. I really could. This is great. I got another one here. Uh, oh, this is great. Yeah, I'll give you one more before I go. And he's talking about education here. Well, education, we need more education. We need to fix education. Well, he doesn't think so. (laughs) He thinks it's impossible. Because what you learn in school about a certain issue, how to fix something today, in 10 years ain't gonna matter. Anyway, he says it never occurs to this uh, preceptor of civic duty. Talking about teachers, I don't even know what preceptor means. <laughs> I didn't look it up. Anyway, never occurs to this preceptor of civic duty to provide the student with a rule by which he can know whether on Thursday it is his duty to consider subways in Brooklyn or the Manchurian Railway, nor how, if he determines on Thursday to express his sovereign will on the, sub- on the subway question, 
He is to repair those gaps in his knowledge of that question, which are due to his having been preoccupied the day before in expressing his sovereign will about rural credits in Montana and the rights of Britain in the Sudan. Yet he cannot know all about everything all the time, and while he's watching one thing, a thousand others undergo great changes. Unless he can discover some rational ground for fixing his attention where it will do the most good and in a way that suits his inherently amateurish equipment. Ouch. He will be as bewildered as a puppy trying to lick three bones at once. He's talking about data overload here. Data overload and a lack of information, a lack of qualified, accurate information. Not to mention the amateurish equipment. We do not have the information to really be informed beyond very forceful opinions and recycled talking points from our incestuous little echo chambers. It's hard to argue with this. It really is. We're getting our information, everything we base everything on. It's from a tainted source. One way or another. And what he's talking about here, he goes on to talk about, is that people need to be taught how to think, not what to think. So they have the habit of mind to address a question critically, as objectively as they possibly can. This is 1919. He's talking about all this stuff, as I love to remind you. Things are exponentially worse. I like to use the heliosphere example. It's blown to the heliosphere. We passed Voyager by now. Humility. Focus on one thing, maybe. Maybe maybe the secret is not to be a generalist, not to know I know all about everything. I know a little bit about this, and I know a little bit about that, and I know a little bit about this. Maybe abandon the generalist mindset and focus on one thing, something you can dive deeply into. The Shallows, Nicholas Carr talks about this as well. This technology is destroying our ability to deep dive into something, to focus on something. I had a guy earlier this week, I posted a 300-word post on Facebook. And maybe it was 500, whatever, not that long. And his first thing, his first comment, sorry to put you on blast, bud. I won't say your name. (laughs) I know you listen. The first thing he says, "Eh, it's long, but spot on. (laughs) How's that attention span doing, bud? You couldn't focus on it? Well, why was it too long? It was 500 freaking words, man. It's a blog post. What? This technology is doing that to us. One of these years, I'm going to get to the shallows, and I'm going to lay all that out for you, how the technology is rewiring our minds to think horizontally, from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, clicking off one topic, going to another topic, rather than picking one and deep diving it to really, really, really understand it. I am guilty. My hand is up. Your Honor, I plead guilty to this. I think I've settled on one or two things, obviously. But it ain't going to be politics. It's not going to be the geopolitical landscape of the Democrats and how they relate to, I don't know, 31-year-old gay Republicans. And I, I don't care. Technology propaganda, critical thought, how people can be manipulated, the psychology behind all of that. It's all, it's on my new banner. Did you see the new banner on the website, by the way? Pretty, isn't it? Propaganda politics and the social media disease and where this is taking us. That's my choice. I'm trying to refine and narrow my mm, uh, subject of study rather than trying to just touch on just about everything so I can seem witty on many things. Know a little about a lot of things and a lot about nothing? That doesn't suit me. And maybe this is how you rebuild, uh, you know, when you're trying to step out of these mobs, these groups, these tribes. Maybe that's how you do it. Maybe you find somebody else who offers you a level of expertise in one thing that applies where you're weak. You don't need to have their political opinion on everything. I don't really care what they think about the Houston Astros cheating scandal. Right? Right? or the Democratic Socialists of America. I really don't care, but if they have something that applies to my field of interest, and they know more about it than I do, then we have a lot to talk about. Maybe that's how you rebuild, I don't know, a specialist tribe. 
Does that make any sense whatsoever? Maybe I'm grasping for straws here. I think we're all a little bit grasping for straws here in this day and age, don't you think? <sighs> Slamming shit around. Gets frustrating. We are in a world of hurt, man. The, the warning signs, the alarms should be blaring in your head, kids. But what's the solution, Todd? I got no idea. I don't. I'm only offering possibilities, I suppose. Learning how to think again. Learning how to detach from these toxins. Keeping us strung out on validation. I'm going to get to that real soon. I'm going to return to that. Go back and listen to the Validation Junkies episode from September in the meantime, will you? Please. That's a primer. It's key. It's huge. It's everything. It's the connective tissue to everything. Social validation. Mark Zuckerberg knew this in the mid-2000s. He who owns that owns everything. He owns it. He owns you as a result of it. More than you'd like to admit. Escapingthecave.com, that's the website. Please cruise on over, check it out. Check out ChristopherMedia.net. Also, make sure if you're subscribed to me, you are subscribed to the Escaping the Cave feed. And yes, fuck Twitter. Till next time, so long. Thanks for clicking in.